I don't need my head to get any bigger. So, right. <laughs> guys, I just turned the recording in. Uh, Cameron uh, was kind enough to allow us to record it, so those who registered and couldn't attend will be able to send them the link. Okay, good. It. So you need to go ahead and uh, uh, acknowledge that, or it won't let you proceed. So. Yeah, I I clicked on it, so we. Okay, we great. Prepared. Yep. Well, great. Well, thank you, Robert. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation to come, and I really do enjoy talking about honeybees. I mean, this is I so I I want to convince you that I am also a beekeeper. I also lost hives this winter, so you know I I feel it too. Um, but this is great. This seems like uh, just I'm glad that Robert asked that question because then I'm looking in the chat over here what everybody's saying, and uh, it seems like you know, a common thread of, of beekeeping is that we all have to deal with this really frustrating and terrible, um, terrible mite. So hopefully something that I share tonight will be uh, useful for you. My, my goal, you know, I wanted to, just like Mohammed even said earlier, he mean, he doesn't want to use um, like particular like acids or maybe some of the harder chemicals and that's okay, right? I mean, I'm not um, everybody's going to make their, their own choices of, of what they want to do and, and what they feel is best. So I'm going to try to give you a broad um, spectrum view of, of Varroa control, and we'll kind of walk through it together in an integrated pest management context. And, and I do want to spend some time um, talking about oxalic acid specifically, because that's where I've done a lot of my research recently. And so I think um, hopefully it will be of interest and, and might be useful for you all. So just to give you a, a little bit more of a background, if I can advance my slides here, let's see. There we go. So um, I grew up in a small town just outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. It's over here. It's called Wapa Valley or, or Overton, Logandale. I don't know if anybody is familiar with it out there. It's, um, you know, I've, I, it's just a hot, dry desert and uh, it's just right outside of a valley of fire and um, you know it it was actually kind of a, a tough go at, at beekeeping when it's so hot and dry um, in the summers I mean we're getting up to the 120s uh, it just gets it gets pretty pretty ridiculous but I do have some beekeeping roots, right? I, I kind of grew up around honeybees and beekeeping, as Robert even mentioned. You know, my grandpa was a beekeeper. It's something I like to talk about because, you know, it's 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 just kind of part of my heritage. And I like to tell people that I was into bees before it was cool, right? When I was, um, when my family was beekeepers, it was like this really embarrassing thing. As like an elementary school kid, I remember um, having some friends come over to my house and they're like, well, what's that in your backyard? And I was like, oh, the bees don't touch him. <laughs> don't go over to They'll throw rocks at him. And it was, but it was kind of just this, this weird thing that my family did. But my grandpa was a sideliner. So he was um, a, a high school principal, but he managed about 200 colonies or so um, that he, I mentioned we were in the Valley. He grew up, or he was, um, living in, in, uh, Wapa Valley as well in, in the hot dry desert. But what he would do is he would, um, overwinter them there. And then it was a good place to, to keep your bees during the winter because the winters were so mild. Um, but then we could, uh, he would take them to California for, for pollination, um, in the early spring. And then about the time, um, that almonds were done, he would take them to, the mountains in southern Utah where there was wildflowers and open prairies where you could go and and this I, this was kind of the good old days of beekeeping where you could just put your bees out there and say all right we'll see you in three to six months and then you come back collect the honey and that's it right but beekeeping is just not that way anymore there's a lot of a lot of work and that goes into it but one of the cool things um, about my grandpa that I don't think I had maybe I, I didn't appreciate until I was much older was that my grandpa was also an educator. He loved to, to teach and he would love to do extension and he would go to an outreach. He would go to like elementary schools. He would go to um, like the county fairs and he would talk about beekeeping and the importance of honeybees. And, and so it was just, um, just a, a cool environment, I guess. I, like I said, it was, it was weird when I was, when I was a kid, but now that I'm older and it kind of followed that same path, it's, it was uh, pretty meaningful to me. So now I'm at the University of Florida. I'm um, an assistant professor uh, position where I have a primarily a teaching appointment. I teach um, 
about nine different courses related to honeybees and beekeeping. It's kind of, I mean, it's unique in the fact that uh, we have developed so many um, courses related to beekeeping. Um, there's, if you think about it, you know, you could go to a land grant university like Ohio State or, or University of Florida, and you could study all sorts of different things related to agriculture. But there's, if there is a person there, it's a, a bee person, like, so in Ohio, you have Reed Johnson, which is, which is great, but they're, they're going to teach probably one course because that's, they have primarily a research appointment. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of lucky that I, I have a really high uh, teaching load because it's, it just kind of sets us apart as something different. And, and I get to, I teach about 500 students a year, courses related to beekeeping. So it's introducing a lot of people um, to the craft. Um, I do have a 30% research, so I do a lot of research as well. And um, up until just last week, I was the distance ed coordinator. So I, I still have like one foot in the world of distance education. So if you have any questions, if you want to do like an, an online master's degree or something related to entomology or beekeeping, um, that actually is an option. You can, you can talk to me about it later. All right, let's jump in to Varroa. This is, this is why we're all here, right? Um, we're all we're all struggling to to control this pest and and with my time today I didn't um, you know depending on the type of talk that I'm giving sometimes I'm giving more of a varroa biology talk sometimes uh, or at least this time I'm going to focus more on the control so I'm not going to dive in too deeply into the biology but certainly if you have questions related to the mites biology that we don't talk about today um, feel free to ask me later so this this mite um, is really worldwide issue. I I I feel it's really the scourge of the honeybee. I mean, this is uh, uh, just a, such a such a terrible problem, and these mites um, are found to have, be feeding on honeybee fat tissues, um, and you know it's really not that's not the problem, right? It's not that the mite is just feeding on honeybee fats. The problem is that they are vectoring and transmitting a lot of different viruses. And, and what's interesting to note is that, you know, Varroa are not really introducing lots of viruses into your honeybee colonies. Bad news for you, your honeybees already have a lot of viruses. I guess that's what happens when you try to cram a whole bunch of individuals together in a tight space. They're going to have viruses that they pick up and it's just going to be kind of harbored throughout. But the problem is, is when you have a lot of mites inside that colony, then those virus loads really start to increase. Um, and, and it can become a really big problem for honeybee colonies. This is a, a figure that I, I didn't create this. This is from the um, Honeybee Health Coalition Tools for Varroa Management. It's a free resource. If you haven't seen this, I strongly recommend that you go check it out. It's very helpful and useful. Um, but here's just a little bit of a, a easy way to explain you know, how and when Varroa becomes such a big problem. So let's first start with this blue line. Here's our bee population. So let's say right now we're, you're, you're just coming out of winter where the bees were, were dormant. Now they're starting, it's spring is starting to come and your bees populations are starting to increase pretty soon, kind of in, you know, maybe June, you're going to reach your peak population. Um, and then starting in probably about July, September, October, you know, they're going to start decreasing. Um, and, and now the Varroa's biology, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to dive deep into Varroa biology, but Varroa can only reproduce inside of honey brood cells. And so their biology is closely tied to, or the mites biology is closely tied to the bees biology. So they will start at a certain point and then they will also increase as the honeybee brood is in increasing. And then once they reach, you know, like I said, maybe right here around September, um, when your bee populations are, are decreasing, though there's still plenty of brood for the mites. And so the mite populations are going to continue to increase. And at this point, you just have so many viruses, uh, just such a high viral load in the colony that, that it could be really dangerous. And that's not to say that Varroa can't be dangerous at other times, but it's usually in the fall season where we run into the biggest problems. Now, um, if I can leave you with one thing tonight, it's going to be that I, I really want you to leave here knowing that, that Cameron Jack told you to monitor your bees, right? I, I feel really strongly about this. Um, you know, we used to say, just check once in the spring, just check once in the fall. 
and you're you'll have a decent idea um but really you need to do it more than that i kind of say like now at a bare minimum you should just really have an eye on your your colony mite loads and be monitoring about six times a year what I, the biggest pushback i hear from that is like well cameron you know i already know that i'm gonna have to treat right so what's the point of monitoring well i think the biggest point of monitoring if you if you know that you're going to have to treat is that you don't know if what you're using is actually effective at bringing the mite loads down right you have to especially before and after treatment i think you really need to be be keeping an eye on it and i i'll tell you again i mean i just i have seen this time and time again the difference between good beekeepers and those that are bee havers um, are those that really check and know their mite loads i mean i can ask uh, there's there are beekeepers that i'm confident are just just fantastic beekeepers and i can ask them any time of the year where are your mite loads at and they'll tell me because they are keeping an eye on it always so i'm going to just tell you you know this is um knowing just because you know where your mite loads are you know that's what's going to help you make some decisions and and it kind of depends especially on on the season so here's another table that i took from the honeybee health coalition tools for varroa management guide um and you know if your colony is is maybe dormant with some brood so maybe that's where you're at right now in ohio they're not fully um in production mode just yet they're still kind of in a slow growth phase well then you're probably looking at like one to two mites per hundred bees is when you should start getting nervous and you got to start doing something soon um, when you reach peak population you can get around you can get away with it a little bit um, peak population even like up to three or four you know you're probably you're in the danger zone you got to be doing something but uh, generally speaking, when we're if we're just going to put like an arbitrary line out there, we usually just say, "Don't let your mites cross three mites per hundred bee." Like I said, that's that's the general goal, but that's not always the case. Kind of depends on on the time of year. Um, so I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about some of the different monitoring strategies that that you can use. I'm not going to get into great detail. This is something that I feel like really intimidates a lot of new beekeepers, but I promise you it's not as hard as you think it is. Um, you collect 300 bees or, or about a half a cup of bees. And I guess right there, that's where people have never done this before. Are like, wait a second, <laughs> how do you get a half a cup of bees? But again, not that hard. And the, the Honeybee Health Coalition um, Varroa Guide actually has some, some useful videos that you can see about how they do this. Um, but let's, let's skip that for now. Let's just say get your 300 bees in a jar. If you have, um, if you have a, you know, a local hardware store that carries a number eight mesh or you can buy it online, um, you, it's just a, a hardware cloth that is big enough for the mites to move through, but the, the you know, the grade is small enough that it'll keep the bees inside. And you can kind of cut out your own little lid that you can replace um, with the jar and put about a tablespoon or two of powdered sugar, roll your bees around, and then you flip it over and you can just gently shake out the mites. The, the mites have suction cup feet, basically, and they can't really hold on when there's a bunch of powdered sugar. And the powdered sugar just calls, causes the bees to just groom themselves and go completely bonkers in there and, and it'll knock the mites off. Um, the big plus for this is that it's a non-destructive way to measure you know, your mites. It, you're, you can open that jar and pour your beads back into your colony and they'll probably be okay. Um, the big con that I have with this is that it's a little bit inaccurate. I mean, you don't know that you got all the mites out and you also don't know how many bees that you have. I prefer the alcohol wash method. It does sacrifice um, 300 bees or so, but I promise you it's in terms of the colony strength, that's not a lot of bees. Um, and, and they'll be okay as long as they're a, a decent size and strength of a colony. Um, and I like this for another reason is just that it allows me to be more accurate, right? It's same concept, you're, you're putting collecting 300 bees, you're putting something like isopropyl, like rubbing alcohol on them, you're shaking for 30 seconds, allowing those mites to come off. And then you can, you can either put like a number so like another one of these lids on and then just dump them out. But I actually prefer, I have a honey sieve that I bought that's just dedicated to my, my washes. And again, the, the top grate is big enough that the mites will flow through it and get caught on the bottom grate, but the bees will stay up here. And you just take it to the sink and you just wash it a little bit. But now I can count the number of bees and the number of mites. And that lets me have like a really accurate 
percentage of the number of, um, you know, that I could come up with and, and uh, know the number of mites per hundred bees. There's one more that I'll just quickly mention. Um, I do not recommend using mite fall, but some people really don't want to, to hurt any bees. They don't want to get into their colony. I would say mite fall, it, but the idea is that you're putting something like a sticky screen underneath. If your hives already have like screen bottom boards on them, then this is an easy way to just see if there are mites in their colony, but it's just really not accurate. I have some data at the very end of the presentation that I'll show you where I, I don't love mite fall. But if you want to see if what you're putting into your colony, like any kind of treatment is actually dropping mites, then this is an okay way to, to measure that. Okay, so let's start talking about some varroa control specifically. Um, I, I'm gonna, I, like I said, I'm gonna take this from an IPM perspective. And, and the, one of the things that I really like about IPM is, is that um, you're trying multiple techniques to, to reduce mite populations, but it helps us also not run out of, uh, or, or, or not create really resistant bees. Um, and we already have some things going for us in the terms of, of Varroa IPM. There are um, already established sampling methods, which is important. Um, we already have some idea of treatment thresholds, about three mites per hundred bees. Uh, but what I'll tell you is the biggest gap that we have right now is we don't have a lot of options in terms of like behavior-based strategies, like cultural or mechanical controls. Um, but we do have some things, and I'll, I'll share that as we go through. Um, well, let me get back to just a second. So one of the important things to note here is that we kind of start at the very bottom, and then as we go, um, as we go up this IPM pyramid is where we're getting into maybe the the more harsh treatments, and not necessarily. I mean, there's some mechanical treatments that could be considered pretty harsh on your bees, um, but but what I mean is that overall for the environment as well, um, you know, synthetic chemicals are like kind of our last resort. And the reason I say that, we'll talk more about those in a minute, but the reason the synthetics are kind of at the last resort is because they just don't break down. They're chemicals that tend to last a really long time. And I'm definitely not anti-chemical. I use chemicals um, for frequently in my honeybee colonies. Um, I just am saying like it's it should be kind of our last resort. So let's talk about prevention because I know that you're all probably thinking, well, Cameron, the prevention ship has sailed for Varroa, right? I mean, you all, I hate to break it to you if you're a new beekeeper and, and um, you're, you're kind of brand new getting into beekeeping, you already, you already have Varroa in your colonies, okay? They're already there. Um, now it's just a, a matter of dealing with them. But prevention does play an important role in this. And, and typically we think of prevention at like uh, like ports, like Florida is, I mean, if, if there's anything bad that's going to come into this country, it's probably going to come through Florida. Um, and, and it's just because there's so many ports, there's just so many access points. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this is a really important role in our state is, is prevention. Um, so with, with Varroa specifically, you know, I, it used to be that we could um, like in the 80s and 90s, beekeepers would import their their packages from countries like Australia um, because Australia had varroa is varroa free. They don't they still don't have the mite widespread um, in their country. And so, you know that this is an example. I, I'll tell you right now, you can't do this anymore. We can't import bees from another country. But, um, but this is just kind of to illustrate how what I'm talking about with prevention. Now, some things that you can do that I think is an important part of, of Varroa prevention um, would be controlling your swarms. Uh, the reason I say that is, is that if you are a beekeeper that is constantly allowing swarms to, to go in from your apiary, um, one, your neighbors are going to hate you, but two, you're also allowing these colonies that are that are just kind of mite reservoirs to be around your your bees and so even if you're treating your bees and you're taking care of the mites i mean they're the chance of them getting reinfested immediately you know after treatment is is pretty high if there are these other bees around that are that are severely infested um, another example of prevention uh, that is there are some beekeepers that they will take a package of of um, you know new bees that they have purchased from another beekeeper and they will treat them with something like oxalic acid or or powdered sugar just to 
to knock off any mites before they even install them in the hives. I'm not advocating for this. It's pretty stressful on your bees to do this, but I know some beekeepers who have done it and, and uh, feel you know, like they do get a decent amount of mites off of their bees and which is a good way to get your yourself started. All right, so let's let's move on now to our, our cultural controls. So the idea of cultural controls means that we're changing the environment to make it less suitable for the pest. Um, and this is often kind of a preemptive measure. Sometimes people will lump it together with prevention, um, but, but in my mind, I, I like to keep them separate. There are some, some different ways that we can change the environment of the honeybee colony to, to reduce Varroa. So one of them um, is using hygienic stock. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this and you might be wondering what in the world is going on here. So the idea here is that there are beekeepers, uh, breeders that will select for um, traits of, of bees that are really hygienic, meaning that they are they are detecting a problem and they are getting it out of the colony. So in this image here, you might have a really solid brood pattern and a researcher or, or a breeder might put um, a canister. This was like a freeze kill brood assay. So they're putting a canister down where they fill it with liquid or put a little bit of liquid nitrogen. They flash freeze and kill all the brood in a known area. And then they would come back in about 24 hours and they would see the percentage of that brood that has been removed. And it looks like this, um, you know, this was from a, a colony that was really hygienic and probably had really good marks because you can see that they mostly removed all of those bees. Um, and so, so this would be an example of, of a really good hygienic colony. And I've, you can see this, I mean, we've even had hygienic bees where we've seen them uncap and pull bees out and you can see the mites. So they can, they can detect when mites are down in those brood cells reproducing and they kind of get them out of those, uh, get them out of the colony. They will try to chase them, bite them. Um, whereas non-hygienic stock, they don't like Varroa, but they don't do very much against it. So um, another example of, of a cultural control changing the environment would be something like causing a brood break. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this um, later on when I talk about my own research, but there are a lot of beekeepers that will just cage the queen for a period of time just to cause a break in that brood cycle. Um, so, because as I said, honey or Varroa can only reproduce in honeybee brood cells. Um, and so if you get rid of the honeybee brood cells, well, then where are all the mites? You know, they're not reproducing, they're just on the bodies of the bees. Um, so this is another example of just a, a cultural control. Um, the mechanical controls, now I'll, I'll say there's, there are a few different examples of this. Basically a mechanical control means that you are physically removing be or sorry you're physically removing mites or doing something to um, apply some kind of force to kill the mites. so uh, a really easy example is using screen bottom boards uh, the idea with screen bottom boards is that you know the the bees are going to occasionally knock one of these mites off of their bodies and if it's a solid bottom board the mite just lands on the bottom a uh, bottom board and then they wait to hitch a hitchhike a ride back up to the main brood nest um, but if you have a screen bottom board, then the mites can fall out the bottom of, of the hive and then get eaten by ants and become part of the circle of life. Um, you know, screen bottom boards, they don't work uh, really efficiently, but it does reduce your mites. It's been shown to reduce mites at about like a 10 to 15%. So, so I've had some beekeepers tell me like, oh yeah, I, I do something for Varroa. I, I have screen bottom boards. I'm like, well, that should not be your only thing. Like that's that's not going to give you um, very much uh, control, but it's better than nothing, in my opinion. And and if you can swing it, um, and you're in an area where where your bees are not going to freeze to death, if you have screen bottom boards on, like I am in Florida, then then I'm I'm pro screen bottom board. Um, there's also drone comb removal. Now this is one that can be really effective, but it's so tricky to make it work uh, right. So I didn't say this earlier um, related to, to Varroa biology, but Varroa are um, much more attracted to drone brood. And probably the reason for that being that drone, um, drone larvae have, or pupa have three extra days of their, of their pupation period. And that those three days, pay big dividends for the mites that are reproducing down in those cells. 
And so if there are, if there's drone comb or if there's drone brood inside of a colony, the mites are probably going to go there. They're going to be attracted to that. So the idea with drone comb is you buy this foundation and you have like a whole frame that's just going to be uh, drawn out um, in, in the size of brood. And if you can convince your queen, um, it has to be the right time of year and, and kind of the stars have to align. But if she fills that whole frame up, with drone brood and you're a good beekeeper that is paying close attention and, and taking good notes, you can wait until all those cells are capped and then you remove that entire frame um, and you can put it in the freezer or something. It's gonna kill all your drone brood, but it's gonna kill all those mites. And then you can stick that frame um, back into the hive and the bees will, they'll consume all the dead drones and it kind of keeps some of the resources there inside the hive. but. But it it's a, actually has been shown to be, you know, you can remove up to like 95% of a mites um, if, you, if, if you can get this to work well. I haven't been very successful with this. It's not something that I'd recommend for, for brand new beekeep, uh, beekeepers, but if you want to try it, I, it's, worth, it's, it, it's worth trying. Um, there are some beekeepers that will just scrape out all the drones that they see. I don't really advocate for that because drones, they do play a role in the biology. I mean, if your queens are going to go naturally mating in the environment, you want to have some drones out there because you don't want to have a bunch of poorly mated queens. So, so I don't necessarily recommend scraping out all your drones, uh, but I guess you also don't need to have lots of drones in your, your, your colonies either. Um, just some other quick examples of a mechanical control. Um, there is this idea of, of hyperthermia. So hyperthermia is the opposite of hypothermia, right? It's where we're actually encouraging heat. Um, and the idea is that Varroa are, have been found to, to die at a certain temperature. So, um, and it kind of disrupts their own reproduction. At about um, 105 degrees, it'll kill the mites. But at about, um, you know, 110 degrees, 110 to 112 degrees, it'll start to kill your brood. And it actually has to be a sustained temperature for about two hours. Um, at that temperature to really have a, a decent effect. So it's it's hard to do that. Um, I'm not really advocating for for this kind of a model. This is just a, kind of a neat idea where some people have made some like glass lids and then they can measure the temperature of what's going on. I'm not advocating for that, um, but I'm just kind of using it to illustrate what what hyperthermia is. Um, it, I'm not an earlier, I'm not really one of those people that it's like an earlier adopter of new technologies. And so I'm kind of waiting for others to kind of work this out. Uh, but I, I'm intrigued by the idea. I think it, it definitely has potential. Um, other mechanical controls, just very quickly, small cell foundation, it doesn't work. Um, so don't, don't waste your time and money on that. Powder sugar packages, I already mentioned that as kind of a prevention example. It also, it can stress out your bees. Um, I'm not a big fan of that, but, but it, it's kind of an example of, of a mechanical control that's physically doing something to remove mites. All right, let's move on to biological control. So biological control by far is the coolest way of controlling a pest. Um, you know, just maybe I say that just because I'm a, I'm a bug nerd and a kind of a biology nerd anyways, but, but the idea with biological control is that you're using one organism to control another one. And, um, you know, this has been used really well in other systems. Um, the problem with, with Varroa is that there's a lot of different ways that, um, it's just hard to, to access those mites. And, and things like parasitoid wasps don't really exist in honeybee colonies because the bees are really good at getting out predators. I mean, kind of related, like relative to other social insects, you know, think of termites, think of ants, um, think of other wasps. You know, they actually have a lot of nest invaders. Um, honeybee colonies really don't. I mean, they're good at keeping things out of their hive. So, so things like things like wasps don't really work well. Entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi can work okay in the lab, um, but it doesn't work great. This is a picture of a, actually a small hive beetle larva that's getting parasitoid, or parasitized by nematodes. Um, it can kind of work, again, this is kind of an example of like, it, it can work really well in a lab. It can work in the soils um, to, to affect small hive beetles, but you know nothing really down the line 
yet um, for for Varroa. Now there's there is uh, some researchers at Washington State University that seem to have a strain of metaresium, which is an entomopathogenic fungi that does seem to be um, doing really well in varroa control. I'm excited to hear more about that, but I, you know, at this point, it's still a ways off. But but I'm excited to hear that there's something promising. You know, there has been lots of things that have been tried. You know, there's been pseudo scorpions were tried heavily uh, for a while there. It's kind of fun if you're having a depressed, you're feeling kind of blue um, and you need a little pick me up, then you can go online and search for some videos of pseudoscorpions chasing around Varroa and eating them. You know, again, in a Petri dish, it works really well. Inside the hive, it doesn't work as well. Same with, with um, Stradiolalapsis is a predatory mite that will eat Varroa if it's, you know, together in a cage match, but it's not gonna really um, work too well inside of a honeybee colony you know the thing is is if you put a bunch of organisms into the hive and they can't catch the mites then they're going to go for easier prey so something like pseudoscorpions you know when they you'll see them um they inside the hive they they kind of stop trying to get varroa and then they just have found you know all we have to do is follow the queen and so the queen goes and lays an egg from you know and cell to cell to cell to cell that you see is the pseudoscorpion following right behind them just eating all those those eggs so so again this they're they're bio, biological control is is interesting but it doesn't seem to um uh, be a viable option at this point all right so now let's get into our chemical controls and as i kind of mentioned earlier there are two levels of chemical control there's this natural or organic chemicals um um, I'm going to kind of put out a caveat in a minute that just because something is natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe, which is true, but the reason it kind of comes before the synthetic chemicals is that natural chemicals do break down in the environment rather quickly, um, and, and that's not true with synthetic chemicals that hang around in the environment and they hang around in the wax for, for long periods of time. So, um, you know, this is kind of that moment where I get on my soapbox for just a minute. And, and as I just said, you know, just because something is organic or something is natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Um, an example is arsenic. Arsenic is a natural compound, right? But it is very toxic. Um, oxalic acid to some degree, a formic acid, you know, even thiamol. There's lots of these that are, that are natural compounds, but it's all about the dose. You know, there are, when you concentrate, um, uh, chemical, it can be pretty, pretty rough. Uh, the other thing is the label is the law. And, and I will say, you know, sometimes I think the labels need to be changed. Um, but the labels do represent a lot of research that has gone into that, that particular treatment. And, um, and then sometimes, you know, beekeepers will say, well, the label says to put two strips in. If I put four in, then I'm going to get, you know, it's going to be twice as effective, but, you know, not necessarily what, what you have to understand is that the mites and the bees are similar enough physiologically that most everything that is toxic to the mite is also toxic to the honeybees. And so when you put a lot of a chemical into that hive, there's a decent chance that it could, could harm that your bees. It, I often liken chemical treatment to something like chemotherapy. It's like you're, you're introducing a level of toxin that is going to kill the mites or kill this the cancer cells but not kill the body and you're doing the same thing you're trying to kill the mites but not kill the bees right um the last thing is to just rotate your chemical treatments if we're all using the same thing over and over and over and over we lose those treatments and and there's a you know a plentiful history of that and i'll i'll mention that in a minute um i'm going to kind of just just mention some of these different treatments um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about oxalic acid in particular. Oxalic acid, as I said, you know, this is one that that can be pretty harsh. It can be quite effective, um, but you need when oxalic acid is everywhere, it's in our food. Um, you know you you eat a fair amount of oxalic acid every time you're eating vegetables. But it's, again, it's the dose makes the poison, right? So if you concentrate it, it becomes an issue. And if you're going to vaporize it, please take care of yourself. I mean, I love my bees. I really do. But my health is going to come before my bees health. And so, um, like I said, it can be, can be very effective, but no matter what you're using, you know, be, be cautious. 
Um, at least, you know, you should be wearing gloves when you're handling any of these chemicals. Um, formic acid comes in the form of, of Mitoway quick strips. Um, they used to be kind of like this, these cardboard strips, but now they're, they're more in these pouch forms. Um, there's, there's different kinds, of course, but a lot of times you see them as like gel pouches. And the idea with, with formic acid is that um, it can be, uh, it, it's it's really volatile chemical, and so within the hive, it, it really depends on the temperature that of when you can use this, um, because if it's really hot outside, it's going to be a little bit warmer inside the brood nest, and then it's going to release too much of your chemical, um, and I've seen formic acid. There's also apigard, which is the active ingredient is thymol. Um, you know, I've seen those really volatile chemicals really burn up a hive. I mean, they just, uh, when I say burn up, I mean, it's going to kill a lot of that brood um, and it's just going to drive your bees right out. If it's too cold, you know, for, for right now, you know, in, in uh, Ohio, it, it's probably not within that temperature range. It might be too cold. And if it's too cold, it's not releasing enough chemical and then it's not doing you any good anyways. Um, so you really do have to kind of hit the sweet spot to make formic acid or to make um, thymol work. Um, there are, there's a, a product out there called HopGuard um, that utilizes hop beta acids. This is a picture of HopGuard. Um, this is another one that has some promise and it kind of depends on where you are. Um, I've heard more success, beekeepers having more success with HopGuard in temperate climates. Um, then in Florida, nobody uses it. They just don't get a good control with it. Um, but, but the idea here, I mean, I, it, it is a, a, a chemical that is extracted from hops, but please, please, please don't be one of those beekeepers that like pours beer on their bees thinking that they're doing anything uh, like I've, I've heard, it's, it's sad, it saddens me to even tell you this, but I've, heard not just once, I've heard twice of two beekeepers that have volunteered that information to me that they just tried pouring beer on their bees to see what would happen. And it, it does nothing besides make your bees very sick. So don't, don't do that. Um, it's in a particular uh, uh, chemical that needs to be extracted from hops in order to be used. Now with essential oils, there are just a million essential oils out there. And so, um, I guess in short, my answer to you is going to be, I don't know. Cause you're probably gonna, after I'm done talking, you're gonna ask me probably about some ass different essential oils. And the answer is probably, I don't know. There's the, the only, um, I mean, there are some essential oils that have shown to be, you know, fairly effective like thyme oil, but that the active ingredient of, of thyme oil that's really effective is thymol. And there's already a product for that through Apigard or Apolifar. Um, and then, you know, people try things like peppermint oil and, and um, clove oil, and, and there's all sorts of just a million different kinds of oils. They, sometimes they, they, they certainly can be effective in a lab, but there's, there's more work that needs to be done. So, uh, you know, I'm not regulatory. I don't really care if you're using essential oils, to be honest, um, even if it's not registered. But, but what I would tell you is to be careful. Uh, don't, don't hurt your bees and don't hurt yourself. Be, protect yourself. Okay, let's go quickly into the synthetics and then I'll share with you some of the oxalic acid research specifically. So as I mentioned with synthetics, this is kind of our last resort. And, and part of the reason for that being is that um, synthetic chemicals will, will hang around for a long time and they will can get into the wax and um, they will, will stay in the wax for, for long periods of time. And, and uh, so the first, in 1987 is when Varroa first arrived in the United States. And at the time that it arrived, you know, everybody um, rushed to Apistan. Apistan was the product uh, that, that was already registered for Varroa. And so um, people jumped on that quickly. It's, it's a pyrethroid, um, which is really toxic to kind of insects in general. So this is an example of, of like, it's all about the dose. If you could really kill your bees, if you put too many strips in, but everybody was using it because it was the only thing out there. And so, you know, we quickly lost that as an option. And so by 1995, we were pyrethroid or the, uh, 
flu resistance to the active ingredient fluvalinate was already widespread. And so then everybody was desperate and the Bayer came you know, to the rescue with uh, their product called Checkmite. Uh, the active ingredient is Kumafos, but the problem is, is everybody's using it, right? Everybody's using it over and over and over and over. And this, this just didn't work um, very well at all. And in about two years, there was kind of widespread um, resistance, and which is a shame because yeah, Checkmite is a really great trade name. Um, then you've got Apivar. Apivar is the active ingredient is is Amitraz. And I will say, you know, we as beekeepers, as the beekeeping community, we've gotten away with Amitraz for a very long time without a lot of resistance. Um, people were using it for decades, kind of illegally, and finally they um, made a, a, a registered product that uses Amitraz. But I'll say, you know, everybody's been using Amitraz uh, all the time, and many beekeepers rely solely on Am uh, on Apivar. Um, and, and so now there are pockets of resistance popping up all over the place. And so we're, we're kind of getting to the point where we're, we're about to lose that as well. So most of these chemicals will come in strips, which make them very convenient because you just drop them in and then you come back in 42 days, you pull them out. Um, so I, I like this idea. I mean, this is uh, really helpful, especially for the beekeeping industry or like the, the commercial beekeepers. I mean, they rely very heavily on, on just very short treatments. Um, but, but we're like, we're really running out of options. And this is where, you know, some of the work of uh, some of my research related to varroa control, I feel is, is really important um, because I want to be able to provide, you know, hopefully find some, some chemicals that, or, or, or non-chemical treatments that can be useful for people. So I'll quickly um, jump into some of the oxalic acid research that I've been doing. You know, as I mentioned, this is something that's been around for a long time, but it's only been, you know, somewhat recently registered. Um, it's been historically used where, where people would take oxalic acid dihydrate um, in this crystallized form, they'd mix it into a sugar syrup, and then they would dribble it onto the, the bodies of the bees. Um, the nice thing about this uh, with uh, treating with oxalic acid is to this point, there has been no um, reports of mite resistance. It breaks down very quickly. It doesn't, it's, it's water soluble, so it doesn't really go into the wax. Um, and it can be, you know, somewhat uh, effective. And one of the most um, effective ways of applying oxalic acid, probably it's been shown, you know, people have, have done different head to head comparisons, but usually oxalic acid vaporization comes out as the winner as the most effective method of applying oxalic acid. It's becoming much more uh, popular in the United States. But the idea is that you're, you're taking these crystals, you're heating them up and you're turning them basically into a gas that's um, coating the inside of the hive and, and exposing the mites and it's causing the bees to groom themselves and you're gonna knock down and kill a lot of mites. Um, right now, the EPA label states that, that um, only one gram of oxalic acid per brood chamber is allowed. And you know, around the time that oxalic acid became, you know, they, they made a, an emergency per uh, use permit. Um, there was some research done in the UK where they found two and a quarter grams was what was the minimum effective dose of this. And I kind of wondered, you know, why did we get the one gram limit? I've actually asked that question for years and I finally think I found an answer. I've, I was emailing people at the USDA and the EPA like, hey, where did this one gram limit come from? Um, but I found uh, an article that was uh, from, an Austrian researcher that was done in the 1980s where they found one gram uh, was enough to kill, uh, one gram was enough to kill mites in a honeybee colony. But the thing is, is they weren't using Langstroth hives. They were using much smaller hives. So nevertheless, this is the current legal limit is one gram. Now there's a method, especially this is used um, frequently in Italy and France. Um, but but I told you a little bit about brood interruption as, as a cultural control, right? If you're if you're caging the queen for 21, 24 days, you're removing all of the brood that is inside that colony. And then where are all the mites? Well, the mites are going to be, they're not going to be down in the cells hiding. They're going to be on the bodies of the bees. And then so beekeepers would use oxalic acid after this period of, of um 
this brood break, and then the idea is in one fell swoop, you should be able to knock down all the mites. So we decided to test this um, and where we had six different groups where we have, um, we either caged them. So one, two, three, we caged the queens ca causing that brood interruption or then four, five, six, where we did not cage the queen because there's also this other school of thought that says, well, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a brood break. If you treat, you know, once a week for three weeks, the idea is that the bees are going to emerge, the mites are going to come out and you'll probably, um, when you treat, you'll probably access or expose those mites uh, to the oxalic acid at some point. And so, you know, we either treated one time or three times, and then um, we had these poor controls that were, did not receive any kind of treatment. And we had 10, uh, 10 colonies per treatment. And we actually had a seventh treatment where we used apivar strips. This is kind of our, our positive control, uh, kind of a, an industry standard to compare to. And here's, boil it down what we saw. This work is published. Um, maybe I can share with some of these articles with Robert later on. And so if you have questions, you can maybe reach out to him or he can post them somewhere where you can access uh, this. But there's, there was a lot of research that went into this um, and we collected lots of data, but I'm just boiling it down to make it really simple. It's, it's easiest to think about their, these results when we're just thinking of the survival. And so here, what we're looking at is the number of colonies that survive. So there's, you know, 10 colonies. We started with 10 colonies in each treatment. And, and here's what we saw with our, with our group that where we just caged the queen, where we just caused that brood break, but we didn't apply any oxalic acid. We had massive losses. This was really harsh treatment for our bees. Um, I think maybe the biggest reason for that was that we maybe applied this treatment too late in the season. Uh, it was definitely a summer treatment for us, but it was, it was late summer um, and, and maybe our bees just didn't have enough time to recover. Um, and this treat, if we, if we keep going, you know, we had 60% uh, mortality. So, so only 40% of them survived when we um, treated with oxalic acid, when we just treated once. When we didn't cage any queens, we had a little bit more survival um, and we had half of the bees survive. And then the same pattern is actually true when we keep going. When we treat three times, we had you know 60% survival, but when we didn't when we didn't cage the queen, we had 70%. Um, our amitraz bees looked really good. I mean, they just they prefer performed well over this uh, three or four month period and and looked really healthy and were ready for winter. Um, the other treatments not so much. And and here's kind of like the big takeaway is that people look at this and they're like, well, you treated three times with oxalic acid at the one gram level, which was the legal limit. And it was the same as doing nothing, right? And that's, that's pretty sad, right? Um, so what I don't want you to do is to look at this and say, well, this means that, you know, we shouldn't do anything because obviously it's not working. Well, that's, that's certainly not the message that I want you to leave here with tonight. But, but what we thought is like, well, we're not really getting good control. So we decided to do another experiment where we said, well, if one gram, if the legal limit is not effective, then let's find the effective dose of oxalic acid vaporization that will actually control Broa. But now that we're going way beyond the um, legal limit, we wanted to make sure that we were observing what was happening to the, the health of the colony. So we have uh, another round of, of treatments where this time we have four different treatments. Um, again, where we have the one gram level, which is the current legal dose. Then we have two grams, four grams, and then we, we have our control. And we replicated each of those 10 times. So we had 40 grams total. This time we didn't go, we didn't even bother with the queen caging. What we were doing is we were measuring mites um, before and after treatment. And then we were treating once a week for three weeks. So didn't worry about that, that brood break because we had such a rough go with it the, the year prior. Um, but we were doing collecting a lot of data where we were measuring colony strength by measuring um, the estimating the number of bees, the number of brood cells, the number of honey cells, the number of pollen cells. And there's a kind of a, a way to do this, a formula that you can use to, to estimate um, these colony strength parameters. So I apologize if this is really small on your screen, but here's... I'm, I'm going to walk you through this because this is uh, some, hopefully some, some interesting findings here. So what we're looking at is the number of mites per 100 bee. 
And at the start of this experiment, we did have some colonies that were pretty, that did have high um, infestation levels, kind of ranging from about you know, six and a half all the way to about four mites per hundred bees. Actually, there's always a bit of the hard part of doing field work with honeybees is that there's always so much variability and depend, it's so hard to try to control it. Um, but, but, you know, at least luckily when we look at this, it looks like they're spread out a little bit, but statistically there was no difference between any of these treatments at the start of the experiment. So let's start with this blue line here. This is our control treatment. And it behaved the way that we would think that it would behave. When you don't treat, look what happens. The mite populations continue to increase, which makes sense, right? There was nothing there to stop it. Now let's look at this orange line. This is our one gram treatment. Um, when we applied the one gram treatment, we applied it three times. Over that three day or that three week period, we do see a little bit of a decline, but it was never statistically different from our control. So that kind of supports what we saw in the previous experiment that, that using the one gram limit does not really do anything. The one gram dose is not very effective. At two grams, we see more of a reduction. And here's now where we do start to see differences between the two gram and the control. Um, then with our four gram, this is that yellow, we see a drastic decrease. So. Um, it is actually providing a decent amount of, of con varroa control. Now, the big question would be, you know, what is that doing to the health of our bees? Well, I'll get to that in a second, but what I want to mention, I, this was some data that we collected as we were doing this, and I just want to show this to you kind of as a, as a point of emphasis to say, you know, why I don't really like using, um, using mite fall as a way to measure my mites. This is what we saw over, over the period of time. We were, we were put, constantly putting sticky boards in our, in our bees or in our hives. And you'd see that every time we treated, the number of mites that fell went up. Um, but then the, about three days after treatment, the number of mites went down and it was about the same as our controls. And then we would treat, we'd see a lot of mites fall. And then three days later, the mite levels would go back to our control. So, and it kind of, you see these spikes, but what I don't like is that it, unless you're adding a particular treatment, that's the only time you really see mites. Even when they had really high mite loads, they all started, or they would, they still looked about the same with mite fall. So it's just not a very good way to measure mites. But if you want to see if what you're doing, what you're applying is actually killing mites, then it, you know, you can, you can see those drops. Um, okay, let's let's look really quickly, and I'll wrap this up soon. Of of what these our our OA doses did to our 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 bees and our our colony strength. So let's let's start with bees here. What you see is all these all these different lines, same colors as before, um, representing the different treatments. They actually all are clustered pretty close together for bees and for brood. But you'll notice that there's a general downward trend, even for the control. Um, you know. But they're but they're clustered really together, which means that the amount of oxalic acid that we are using doesn't seem to be particularly even at four grams doesn't seem to be like reducing the number of bees doesn't seem to be reducing the number of brood, um, and likely what we're observing in this general decline since they're all declining equally together it's probably just more of an effect of the season. This experiment was done in September, again. September is still kind of that late summer season in Florida, and we're just, our queens are slowing down. Um, our honey and pollen, they might look like they are major differences, but they really aren't. Um, they, they kind of perform the same. Uh, there, there's huge air bars there because there was a lot of variation between the colonies, even within the same kind of chemical treatment. So, so all in all, we didn't see any differences to our colonies. Um, this Again, this is a short snapshot of time, so I can't say that in three or four months they look different, but I will kind of tell you anecdotally um, for what that's worth is that our bees that were treated with four grams looked really good. They looked healthy and it seemed to kill more mites and the bees did fine. So what I'll, what I'll say to you as kind of like the, the wrapping the OA conclusions um, is that the, the current legal limit of one gram of for oxalic acid vaporization is just not enough. But we do start to see some better control at two to four grams. 
And, you know, interestingly, and, and I guess what brings me some hope is that even at four grams, we didn't see any real negative effects to our overall colony health. Now, that doesn't, I mean, I, I already kind of preached that the label is the law. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that you can run out and go use four grams in, in your colonies. But, but what I hope is that this is going to support um, a label change. And I've actually been in frequent conversations with the EPA and the USDA about changing this limit. And um, while nothing has, has happened just yet, because it takes the federal government a long time to do anything, but, but it, does, um, it does seem like a change will probably come down the line pretty soon, um, because they're aware of it. There's data that we can draw on from Europe. Um, there's multiple researchers in the United States that have kind of confirmed what we've seen. It, it seems like there's enough evidence to, to support a label change. Um, probably not to four grams because there's that that's kind of a big jump, but they'll probably take a two gram step at least early on. Um, and, and we can hopefully get some more research and more people, um, some more evidence to show that if four grams is safe for bees, um, then it, then it might be useful. So what I think needs to be done still with OA is with OA vaporization research, you know, we still kind of have to do to find out what that upper limit is. And, and we also need to work this into an IPM system because I don't like, again, I don't want anybody to get hung up on just one treatment. It really should be something that we're rotating. So kind of wrapping all of this up, I just want to tell you closely monitor your varroa levels, keep an eye on that. Um, and, and see, you know, what, if you're, what you're applying, if, if it's having any kind of an effect there's likely not going to be a silver bullet for Varroa. So if you're just using the same thing over and over and over, you're going to probably um, end up causing more harm than, than good. So road, be sure to rotate those treatments. And last things, I'm going to just mention that um, I, I referenced this Honeybee Health Coalition document um, several times. If, if you haven't seen this, it's free, it's useful, and I, I strongly recommend you go check it out. Last thing is kind of just a quick shameless plug. You know, as I mentioned, I have a teaching appointment. This is what I do. I teach a lot of beekeeping courses. Most of these courses are available online. In fact, I just um, started an online beekeeping certificate program. It's different from the master beekeeper program. And, and so if you're just interested in, in learning more about bees, then you should definitely seek out a master beekeeper program. Um, if you want course credits like university credits, that's what I'm trying to offer and kind of spread the word about because, again, there's just nothing really like this in the United States um, to really get university credit and training related to bees and beekeeping. So if that's something that's interesting to you, um, certainly reach out to me and I'll, I'll be happy to give you a little bit more information. I have classes specifically on, on kind of more of the commercial aspect. I have study abroad class I'm taking. Um, 12 students to Thailand this year. We have some that are, a couple that are just beekeepers that are interested in going. Um, so, you know, there's, there's uh, even, you know, even if you're a non-traditional student and you still want to go on some of these study abroad trips, like that's, that's an option. Um, as well as like just some basic beekeeping classes and honeybee biology, you know, there's, there's quite a lot. Um, and I even have, I teach class like insect toxicology, if you're interested in, in chemistry and, and how pesticides might affect honeybees. So with that, I'll, I'll shut up so we can um, uh, get to hopefully some questions, but I, I'll just say that, you know, you feel free to, to reach out to me. If you haven't listened to our podcast, um, it's, I think it's really good. And I hope, um, I'm sure some of you have, have listened to it and hopefully enjoy it. So with that, I'll, I'll try to take some questions. I see some in the chat and I can just try to do that. Or, you know, we can also, Robert, I can let you kind of uh, maybe moderate that if, if you want to do it that way too. Yeah, we have uh, Jeff Jones with us. He's the secretary of the club and Randy Katz. He's the vice president. They'll be presenting some questions that we were not able right. to answer. And right, we also right. online with us, we have Roseanne Silka. She's the treasurer as well. Great. Go ahead, Jeff. So um, one of the questions that uh, appeared in the, uh, in the chat while you were talking was about uh, probiotics. This was back when you were talking about IPM. And <clears throat> the question was, was driving at whether, um, you know, the probiotics that we're hearing so much about for human health 
is a uh, has a, been studied for its impact in uh, in bees and whether there are pathways there to help improve their health and resistance. Yeah, that's a great question and um, and really an interesting subject. Uh, I will just say, generally speaking, there's still a lot of work that needs to go into research related to honeybee gut microbiota of, of, you know, how they could be influenced by, by different probiotics. They certainly can. Um, and, and there's, there's more work that's coming, uh, uh with that soon. Um, but, but I would say it's, it's not quite there yet. And so I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, as I already said, I'm not, I'm not really an early adopter, but actually I would love to hear it. If people, if people try some of these products that come out and, and as they come out, um, if, if you find that things are, are working or not working, I'm interested to hear about it. Uh, but so I see it as an avenue. I think it's just gonna, and there are people working on it, no, no doubt, um, but it's, it's maybe gonna take just a little bit more time. It's, it's a lot to untangle. There's a lot of things going on inside those bee guts that we just don't even know what's, what, what it's all about. Here's a question for you, Cameron. Uh, Matt asks, does the uh, OA dribble method, uh, how does that compare to the vaporization in terms of efficacy? Yeah, great question. Again, I wish I, I, I should have brought this up. I should have said something about it. Um, so actually, right now, as I said, the uh, in, in a head-to-head -head combat, head-to-head -head with, with uh, oxalic acid vaporization, oxalic acid dribble, um, at an effective doses, oxalic acid vaporization seems to be better. But with the current one gram per brew chamber limit, oxalic acid is not doing, oxalic acid vaporization is not doing anything. However, oxalic acid dribble still does kill mites. So if you're going to use OA right now, I, I would say until the label changes, I would use the dribble. Um, it can be quite effective. The, the one thing with oxalic acid though is that it does require multiple treatments. This is why it's not really it's not really a, a popular treatment with, with commercial or sideliner beekeepers that would have, you know, hundreds or thousands of colonies. They just don't have time to go and apply treatments over and over and over and over. Um, but, but if you have a few bees in your backyard, then I would, I would recommend oxalic acid dribble and, but it is going to take maybe three or four or even five treatments before you really knock down a level of a level of mites that will make you feel um, feel okay about it. The uh, I, I had I actually had a question on uh, your study where you um, concluded that the four gram dose of uh, the oxalic acid vapor treatment was most effective in reducing your load. Um, do you how long does that benefit extend in an environment that's you know where the bees are surrounded by infestations everywhere they turn? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and you're not going to like this answer, um, but it's, it's the truth. It depends, right? Um, we actually, I, I'm, we're kind of getting the data together and I don't, I haven't really been talking about it yet because we're still, we've, we've kind of done some of the analyses, but we're still sitting around and, and talking about it as a group. We just finished a, a large study where we took eight different chemical treatments and we applied them in the fall. Um, then we applied them again to different or to, to different groups of cohorts of colonies. Um, fall, summer, spring, winter, like all the seasons. And we watched. We would treat them until we could, uh, you know, bring the mite population down. And then we would follow them and see how long it takes for those mite populations to rebound. And um, you know, with OA it was the same. I mean, it, it, it can, it depends on how, how low that starting or once you've treated what that brings your mite population to. Um, but if it's, if it's effective at keeping it somewhat low in, in certain seasons, it's going to maintain a really low growth. Um, in the summer, just because you knock down the mites to one mite per hundred B, then they're going to bounce back you know, kind of late summer, fall, they're going to bounce back again. So, 
So oxalic acid in particular is really good as, as like a, a fall winter treatment when there's less brood inside of the colony um, and there's less chance that those mites are going to kind of, they're going to kind of grow, their populations are going to grow kind of slower. Um, then it, then it works really well, but, but yeah, the, the coverage, the amount of time that you get from, from using different chemical treatments, it, it's going to depend. Yeah. I, and then sort of somewhat related to that is what about combination treatments? Um, it, where you might be using a combination of oxalic acid and formic pro or one of the other other treatments? Yeah, good question again. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be untangled there because while I think that's that's certainly a potential, um, as I as I said earlier, that you know the things that we're using to kill Varroa are off also quite toxic to the bees. And if we're doubling up on some of our treatments at the same time, it could really overload our bees immune system and, and cause those cause some significant harm to our to our colonies. So you kind of have to be careful there. Um, but I think there's a place for that and and that work still kind of largely needs to be done. I mean that's kind of what I was trying to do when I was um, causing a brood break and so as applying a cultural control and a chemical control at the same time. Um, I think, you know, there are things that there are ways to do that. Um, I would be kind of a little bit leery of adding two chemicals at the same time. I think that would be a pretty, a pretty harsh, it, it could be potentially harsh on those bees. So. Here at Cameron, someone's asking, Barbara asks about foggers instead of vaporizers. And is that a, a safe, safe alternative? Um, so what I'll say is, um, you know, right now it's, it's not a, a approved application method. I, I kind of have a little bit of issue with the, the foggers just kind of as a safety thing, you know, it's, it, if you use, if you're being careful, you know, people are going to be you're still going to do what they want, what they want anyways. Um, and it, it can work, but with OA, it's, it's not, I like OA vaporization because I know exactly how much I am putting inside that hive. I guess it depends on what kind of vaporizer you're using, but if you're using something like pro vapor, something there, you measure it out and then you pour it, like flip it over and it blows the oxalic acid in there. You know, I like that because I know what I'm putting in there. With the foggers, you're kind of just taking a guess. You pull the trigger a couple times and, and you're getting some idea or, or you, you don't really have much of an idea of, of how much is making it into it. Um, the concept is, is similar, I mean, but you're also using something that's kind of like a flamethrower and it, it's potentially, um, it's just a little bit more dangerous to the bees. I, I will say that we've just completed, actually today was the final day where we just did a head to head with an OA fogger, OA dribble, and OA vaporizer. I don't have those data for you um, just because today was the last day of sampling, but soon I will, will have some of that information. And maybe I next time I, I come to the club or something, we can chat about that. What, one question to drag you back to the your, your studies on the dosage of oxalic acid. Um, if you, uh, did you measure, were you able to see any different short-term toxicity in the bees between the one gram and the four gram treatments such that you might have a contraindication for doing a weekly treatment with a four gram dose as, a, as opposed to a one gram dose on a weekly treatment? So we did them on a weekly treatment as part of that um, experiment we were doing once a week for for three weeks um, and and we didn't I didn't see anything that would give me pause I mean those bees looked really good and they even you know weeks after the experiment they continued to look really good um, I didn't measure you know sublethal effects like if I had collected some bees and did some more like molecular analyses to look at gene expression and see if if there were any like immuno genes that were turned on because they're dealing with this excess oxalic acid, you know, I didn't do any of that and di 
dive that deep into it at, at this level. Um, but, but just from a very basic standpoint, I mean, the bees looked good. It didn't appear to harm them. Um, and, and, you know, I will say this kind of off the record. It's not really off the record because it's being recorded, but we've done oxalic acid at four grams a few other times and in, in other experiments and um, with other with other things and and that we've never noticed any really negative effects those bees look they end up looking really good so cameron it's also good to say that you should not be using oxalic acid with the supers on during a nectar flow right yes, or does it really so, make a difference so this is a good this is an interesting point robert i saw somebody quickly in the in the or just a minute ago somebody in the chat um had asked about the fda ruling so here's here's the tricky part. So it, it gets it gets a little confusing, and I'm to be honest, it, it's confusing for me as well. But the FDA has come out and said that they are not going to look for oxalic acid in honey. That's I mean, at at this point, they from what they have screened when they screen honey that's coming in, you know, big shipments from commercial beekeepers, and um, they've never seen oxalic acid come in at at crazy high levels enough to to warrant any level of concern and as i said oxalic acid is in a lot of the food we eat um and and we're picking it up uh kind of naturally and and so it it does not seem to be a level of concern to the fda now um recently the last year uh, um the the USDA, I'm trying to think who holds the label agreement at this point, that the current um, temporary use label said that they they were allowing honey supers to be on for oxalic acid use, but apobioxyl, the, the legal treatment that you buy, I mean, d does not have that on its label, and so you cannot use it. So it's, it's, it's kind of complicated and it's coming in a few different, there's kind of mixed messages. I would just tell you to be safe. I would not use it. Um, uh, and, and you don't really, you don't want to say, if you're selling your honey, you don't want to give anybody a product where it gives anybody any level of concern um, with your product anyway. So, so I would say it's, it's best to just remove them. Um, and I hope that there are some more clarifying instructions that come down from from the the government um, later on. So we don't have like mixed messages coming from everywhere. So is there is there a particular group that works with the USDA and advocates for beekeepers? Like you're finding with four gram, where you can prove to them, look here here are the colonies. You know there's no harm done to the colony or maybe in the not much uh, exotic acid is left in the honey. So there, who advocates for us to, to be so able to use that, four gram or five gram or three grams? That's a good question, Robert. And I'm still kind of learning. Uh, this is kind of my first time that I've ever really approached them about something in terms of like a label change or a ruling. So I, there are people at the um, at the USDA and the EPA that I've had frequent conversations with um, that are kind of over the honeybee realm. And my understanding is that they reach out and they work with different um, researchers um, at the at the kind of the federal researchers or at uh, university researchers, and they kind of come up with some of these plans, but they don't. It's, it's just a hard, kind of a hard road to cross. There's lots of red tape and it gets difficult to even make a simple change like this. From my conversations, I'll just tell you, it seems like everybody at the USDA is on board with this. Everybody at the EPA seems like on board with a two gram um, level. It's just kind of getting through the red tape to be able to, to actually do it has been the struggle. So I don't know if there's one particular group out there that's advocating and, and lobbying for this with with USDA um, or EPA but but they are there's groups within those government agencies that are reaching out to others okay uh, Marshall you've raised your hand if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question 
Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I uh, really appreciate the general group's uh, involvement in all this. I'm a very new beekeeper. Robert has been very patient with my questions. Um, one of the things that my friends and I will do uh, as a hobby is we'll do some like preparedness type of stuff. And the question uh, came up is that, you know, is this even something that is a sustainable situation if we're not able to access, you know, the OA or uh, some of the essential oils or some of those other things? Um, is it even possible to be able to have a large group of hives um, in, in the absence of being able to have access to all of these other fancy chemical treatments? Or we just accept the fact that half of the, 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 the hives would die every single year? So, so if, I'm, if I'm understanding you right, Marshall, you're, you're saying, does, I mean, do we have to just accept that we're going to have to use a lot of we're going to have to to use this, and we if we don't have access to a chemical treatment, are we are we kind of out of luck? Is that what you're? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so so, um, as I said, you know, there are some other, tr like I mentioned, hygienic stock. I mentioned um, some non chemical controls. There are ways that you can help minimize. Uh, your mite levels, but to be very frank, I mean, I believe that you you really have to use some kind of chemical treatments um, if you want to keep your bees strong and healthy. It's just it's just gotta it's gonna happen, um, and they're gonna get there. And uh, so, so in terms of of like preparations and things, you know, there are some chemicals that you can. Um, you can stockpile to some degree, but some many of them would just expire if you if you were like hoarding and buying a whole bunch of them anyways. Um, so, so you you that might not necessarily be the right way to go. Um, I think if you got into a situation where you wouldn't be able to obtain the chemical treatments, then you got to do all you can to to try to use some of these other methods. Um, but but it would be a tough go. It really would. Did I get did I did I answer your question, Marshall? Yes, thank you. And to, to clarify, I'm not sitting on a on a pile of spam and can't, <laughs> well, I didn't think that you were. But it was a, you know, the last few years have been something where we started to think about that. And it was a question that came up. I'm like, I don't know, and I don't even know where to get that information. So this opportunity came up and I had to ask you. Thank you. Right, uh, Mohammed, go ahead. Do you have a question? Hey, Rob, th thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate you guys putting this together. Uh, very informative. Um, I do have a question about, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I lost uh, three out of four of my hives. And uh, and uh, Dr. Cameron, do, do you know of any like a quick test or something to rule out that uh, the mite killed my my bees? I was thinking about what Robert mentioned earlier that uh, to test uh, the dead bees for to do a, a alcohol wash, but I was gonna like throw all that with four or five cups uh, together and kind of do a wash. Uh, but I, I, at that point, when I found them de dead, I, I thought it's, it's not, uh, it's pointless to do any tests because the bees are there, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. they're already dead. And uh, I, I think the, the mites also doesn't ha handle the cold, right? So if, if, uh, if, if my bees are dead at the bottom of the, you know, uh, the, the hive, uh, and, and exposing all these mice to the cold, they, they're not going to be on the bees after that. They're going to so, die too, sure. Right. Um, so, so that's a good question, Mohammed, of, of how yeah. you would maybe like use uh, your CSI techniques or um, figure out uh, what what actually killed your bees um, after they're dead, and and that is uh, that's kind of difficult to do with with um, Varroa specifically. I mean. If the bees are just really, really sick, I mean, you could potentially see them um, with the four wings, but you had already mentioned before that you had looked for that and you didn't see it. Um, and, and so what I would say is it, it's, it's hard to know um, for sure, but usually when your bees drop off really, really quickly and they have, there's a lot of food stores, there's you know, seemingly like there, there are some brood in the colony. They seem to like otherwise have some resources, but they just died kind of quickly. That can really, that can happen with, with really high virus levels in the colony. Um, and, and so 
uh, doesn't really help you too much. I, I don't necessarily have a great answer for that because um, it's hard to know. But but certainly, there. Are, I what I would try to do is rule out other things. You know, um, rule out starvation. Um, maybe rule out some of the maybe the cold temperature, the really high humidity levels that could happen during overwintering periods. Um, and if you can kind of rule some of those things out, it was probably Varroa. So sorry, it's not a great answer for you, but but that's a, it is kind of tricky. I have Thank two, you. two more questions. John Caldwell, you've had your hand raised here for a while, so please go ahead. Hey, John. Hi, Dr. Jack. <clears throat> um, I'm, a, I'm a foreigner. I'm from South Florida. Yeah. And I was invited by my <laughs> friend, Chris Caston, and I'm a disciple of uh, Dr. Jack. And, <clears throat> and I'll, my only input real quick is that if you don't treat for Varroa, you're going to have dead bees. But on my next question directly to Dr. Jack is, um, it, where are we heading? What are you guys doing at UF at that wonderful entomology lab that's um, the next step for finding a solution to this problem? Yeah, great question, John. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Um, good to have a familiar face. So, the uh, we're we're doing a few different things. Uh, so, one of the areas of of focus for me specifically is um, I have been uh, screening different compounds. So, so we're kind of running into the situation where we don't have a lot to, we're, we're preaching to people, you know, rotate, rotate, rotate. But then the answer is like, well, what should we rotate? There's not a whole lot of good options out there. And so um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is, is find different options and find different active ingredients. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm using some that are, um, that where we already have some information on, some of them are already, labeled treatments that are used in other, you know, ag agriculture for use for agricultural use in, in other systems. The reason I'm starting there is because um, if we do find something that works, then it's much like fewer hoops to jump through to, to get it turned into a product that beekeepers can actually use because there's already a lot of environmental impact data and there's there's already a lot of research that's gone into it. Um, and so that's that's one avenue is, is looking for new active ingredients. The other avenue is is really kind of this IPM uh, concept of where we're, we're trying to look at the efficacy of different chemical treatments. We are combining different treatments like like a question was asked earlier, trying to find something that um, uh, maybe a system that works. We're trying to find ways to to better measure and estimate mite populations, um, and we're we're working on. Maybe a lot of you have heard of like Randy Oliver's calculator, kind of where you can put in your mite loads and. Um, say what kind of chemical treatments you want to use or particular treatments you want to use. It kind of helps you kind of plan out your year. Um, we've, we've kind of actually been in the works with that for, for a long time as well, um, collecting a lot of data to kind of feed that, that kind of a model. And so we'd like to come up with some, some really helpful tool for beekeepers. So, so this is kind of where we're headed. Um, there's, of course, you know, Jamie has his own research team. I've got my research team. Amy's got her amazing extension program. Um, so there's there's different avenues that, that we're going on. Jamie's kind of doing a lot of basic biology and, and really interesting like honeybee genetics work. I've kind of really focused more on, on um, the control of Varroa, small hive beetles and Nozema is kind of where just kind of pests and pathogens has kind of been my, my primary focus. Can I interject one other question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that the beauty of, of Dr. Jack being at UF and there's so many beekeepers in South Florida is that they have this huge onslaught of, of um, commercial beekeepers and not throwing anybody under the table, but 
commercial beekeepers have been working on controlling Varroa with different venues for a long time. And part of the issue on research was that if some guy was using a chemical that was not um, approved for Varroa, but was proving effective, they may not be able to be researched at UF. But UF opened up a program that possibly would allow kind of like an anonymity of commercial beekeepers sharing data with their researchers so that they could look at different products that had already been approved. And I think that was inferred in that conversation, Dr. Jack. And is that proven, is, is my statement accurate? And has that proven positive? Yeah, good. Um, so certainly we work with beekeepers all the time and, and um, you know, we, we hear from them what they're doing, what they're finding. And it's taken a bit of time actually to build these kind of relationships. And I'll even say, I mean, we don't always have great relationships with, with a lot of commercial beekeepers. Um, and we're trying to build those bridges and kind of mend, maybe mend uh, any kind of bad, poor feelings between research and and the commercial industry so that we because it's going to take both I mean it's got to be a partnership and for us to have like any real meaningful impact so we certainly have it the conversation goes both ways where we're trying to share what we can and listen to what they are finding so that we can kind of test it in maybe a more formalized way so yeah good point John Uh, Matt Diepenbrock, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Hey, um, Mohammed mentioned earlier before the meeting really got started about essential oils. And has anyone or even, you know, maybe U of F, have you guys looked at any of these various types of essential oils, um, application rates or, or strength of those oils and their efficacy or anything like that? Yeah, great question, Matt. So we definitely have in the lab setting, like we've looked, as I said, we're screening for new chemicals. We've we've looked uh, in the lab, at lab level. And we found, I mean, just like others around the world that have been testing different um, different uh, essential oils where, where we have some hits, you know, there are things that, that potentially work, but it's hard to necessarily to make it work it, inside the hive and so that's that's really kind of the the next steps that that probably need to happen that just haven't really been um explored as thoroughly and and uh, because it's not just about finding an oil that that works i mean you have to find a way to deliver it effectively um and and formulate it appropriately for it to actually be effective so so there's there's some work to be done there um but but certainly I think it's uh, it, there is an avenue, um, and and it's it's promising, but but from what I've seen, you know, the efficacies are still nowhere near where a lot of the synthetic chemicals are. Um, so they might take repeated uses uh, to really be able to to measure a meaningful effect. But but um, certainly, it's it's on the the research radar, not just our lab, but people all over the world. Got it. Thank you. Great job tonight, by the Thanks. way. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Greg, last question. Uh, we apologize, Dr. Jack. It's, it's getting late. Uh, so Greg, go ahead, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, and hopefully we'll be able to wrap it up. Thank you much for taking the time. Um, the one question I have is I see a lot of talk around the serial use of oxalic acid when even the apobioxal directions or honeybee health coalition will talk about it not being effective with brood meanwhile if you use in a broodless condition typically going to be in winter or in combination with splits the efficacy is actually quite high um, even close to that of apovar but it seems we're still just due to ease of use we're still promoting a serial treatment instead of while we do have brood on the colony instead of a broodless condition we're going to be much more effective with fewer treatments um which is fewer inputs into the hive with a better result so if you can get that good yeah thanks thanks greg for bringing this up so you certainly um if if 
like as you mentioned in winter when they're the colonies are broodless it's going to be more effective no doubt about it and you would have fewer treatments but but and in reality i mean that's uh, at least coming from somewhere like florida where we don't really have uh, a a full-on brood break. I mean, there's uh, our bees are going to have brood kind of year round. There's not a great time to use it, but beekeepers are desperate. We need to find something, so we're gonna we're gonna probably use it even while there's brood in the colony, um, even though it might be a little less effective. But but I, I agree with you. We don't want to. You certainly don't want to overdo it in a serial treatment of from over and over and over um, could potentially cause some harm. All I can say right now, Greg, is that, you know, at, at four grams once a week for three weeks, I mean, we're doing, we're not seeing those, those really negative effects on the colony. That, that's why I kind of think like, we kind of do have to find what that upper limit actually is and then how much is too much so that I can come to meetings like this and tell people like, this is, you're going to need to really pull on the brakes. Like, don't go, don't go crazy. Um, don't, don't hurt your bees by going too far. So Anyways, that's, that's, I guess, my, my two cents about that. No, Dr. Jack, I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm up in the Chicagoland area, Northwest Indiana, and what we have found great success with, success with is using it in combination with the brood breaks. Time them ahead of a nectar flow, that way we still get positive honey production. We're going to hit a broodless period. Um, the splits that are taken off with the queens are primarily just moved with open brood. That way, a single treatment to that queen being moved over, they're good. Um, and then the other side is it's whether you import a cell or allow them to make one, when you go back and check in a month, you're going to be back in that same broodless condition or just a small amount of open brood, a single treatment on that. And we're seeing efficacies um, exceeding 95% across the board. Oh, that's impressive. Did you email me about that a while back? So, yes. Okay. That was you. Okay. I was going to say yes. somebody, somebody emailed me and, and had a really nice, um, a uh, nice system that that we had talked about as a lab that we're like, well, we should we should try this out and see if we could we could make this work. So that sounds interesting and and certainly um, uh, it, it sounds like it could be a potentially really really useful way to do this. So thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Thank you for taking the time tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for for having me, Robert. And yeah, and uh, thank you very much. Very informative. Uh... A um, lot of good comments, and we thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have little kids and staying up this late, and tomorrow you got to report back to work, so we appreciate it. No problem. Well, thank you. Thank you all. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Greg, uh, would you, uh, Greg, are you still online? Yes. Um, would you uh, be able to share this? Uh, research or testing that you've done with the club, maybe um, uh, at a later time where we can maybe either share it via a document or have a presentation like this? Sure. Yes, yeah, it's, it's something we teach with a lot of our newer beekeepers and because everybody's struggling with Varroa across the board and we absolutely are in alignment with what you're, with what you're promoting here with IPM and just trying to deal with it at the lowest level possible with the fewest uh, amount of external inputs trying to work more with the bees biology um, with minimal, minimal chemical or organic or addition, additions. And Greg, what uh, club are you with? Ileana Beekeepers Alliance. Okay, great. And John, thanks for joining us from, uh, from Florida. You know, when, You're muted again, John. So, well, if you don't have any life, you just hang in on Zoom meetings about bees. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love Dr. Jack, and you guys need to keep your ear to the ground and watch what's going on in the UF uh, B lab and what they're doing for the betterment of every backyard beekeeper and every commercial beekeeper. And I'm proud that we're in South Florida uh, helping to support those folks. And I'm sure glad I don't live in Summit County anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, John, we do have a spy who's at least uh, in, inculcated himself into the University of Florida system, and that is Robert over here who can tell you about that more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just finishing the advanced uh, um, master beekeeper class. And Dr. Cameron taught several lectures on uh, pathogens and pests for honeybees. Well, I, I, I'm a, I am a, a advanced master beekeeper, and that's a um, kind of a disillusional statement on my part because they say you're an advanced master beekeeper before you become a master beekeeper, and I never took that step to master beekeeper. So, Robert, I hope that you take that step forward to become a master beekeeper. Yep. Planning on it. I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of it. It's sometimes a lot of hours on the computer, but uh, it's worth it. Good evening, everybody. Good night. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.